that? That James, yeah. <laughs> so I know we talked a bit yesterday about, um, well, first off, I'm not really a journalist. I haven't really done an interview before, so <laughs> I figure we're just going to talk about some of the stuff in the movie yeah, and great. whatnot. And uh, something I'd like to ask you about is um, what's effects um, supervisor, right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, so what's your view on the merging of practical effects with visual effects? And what's your, your preference kind of like when, the, when there's the opportunity to do more practical stuff do you enjoy having that where you have like the baseline kind of to work with? Yeah, I, th I think that's like, and this this is actually a really good film um, in terms of like being an example of that handover between practical special effects and then kind of the post visual effects. Yeah. Um, we worked with a supervisor named Joel Hynek who um, I'd worked with previously on Man of Steel. Uh, okay. He's sort of Vancouver based okay. and um, he worked with Matt early on. They looked at a bunch of reference from movies, um, they looked at like The Thin Red Line and they looked at like Bridge on the River Kwai, like old stuff, newer stuff, um, to try to figure out like what kind of explosions they wanted, how much grit, how much moss, that, and that sort of thing. So they sort of arrived at a, um, a palette of different kinds of war effects. Yep. And Joel was really instrumental in sort of bringing kind of practical hands on knowledge, okay, like on how they could, they could create each of those kinds of effects. Right. And um, I think for, for me, and, and I, I think for most visual effects people, it's um, you spend so much time trying to make things look real that anything that you can get in the picture that's real to start with is super helpful. Yeah. yeah. There, I mean, there's, there's definitely some trade-offs. Like one thing that can be challenging is if you've got um, smoky kind of stuff, mm -hmm. um, fitting characters into a plate, like a piece of photography that's got that kind of thin, smoky stuff can be tricky sometimes. Okay. And actually, the thin stuff's usually not too bad. It's when you start getting like gritty particulate, like you can't. It's not practical to like go in and roto every little yeah, piece okay. of sand or grit. Yeah. So to fit the character in there can be can be a challenge. And you know, in some cases, we would shoot stuff, and I'd be like, okay, that's that's great reference, but we're gonna have to recreate that digitally. Surprised, like we had. Um, there's one shot in the movie in particular uh, where the apes are you know, battling on the trench and the, the soldiers are advancing up the, the hill. And um, it's that kind of big uh, spin around shot. And our compositor actually figured out a way to integrate the digital apes into the practical explosions, which was like a big, ah, big win. Um, so we ended up like rebuilding pieces of things and rebuilding like the front part of the explosion, being able to keep a lot more of what was actually photographed. And so you get all the, all the dynamics, all the kind of um, variation in sort of different parts of the, the explosion, all that stuff you kind of get for free when you do practical stuff. Yeah. And especially if you're working with somebody like Joel, who's really on top of their game, really knows what they're doing, mm -hmm. it can make a big difference in the overall kind of realism of the piece. Yeah. And it's incredible how far like the effects have come now, because like the audience, they have no idea where like where the, the lines are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, ho hopefully that's the case. That's yeah. <laughs> that means we're doing our job right. So what do you think about the uh, future of different formats, like say virtual reality? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're actively involved in the kind of the VR space. In fact, we're doing a little piece for Planet of the Apes oh, yeah. um, as you know, part of the, um, the, you know, the kind of the whole, the whole thing. Um, at the moment, I think, it's, I think it's really exciting because I don't think people, I think there's been some really interesting projects. I don't think that it's like, you know, come to maturity at all. No, um, no, and, no. and so there's a lot of exploration and there's some really, there's some really interesting, um, uh, you know, false starts as well. Things that like, um, that sound exciting and don't quite work or things that sound like they wouldn't work and actually end up being really interesting and exciting. So I think it's a, it's a cool new space and um, hopefully, you know, it, it keeps maturing. Yeah, because I think it's definitely gonna, there'll, there'll be a bigger home for it first with CGI, because obviously, if you're trying to go for that effect where the audience member can actually basically go into the movie and like yeah. move around and see what's going on, there's obviously going to be quite a few limitations if you're filming with actors because you basically yeah. have to capture everything in one take. Yeah, uh, yeah. You, you, there's no, you can no longer hide things with cuts. Exactly. Where, whereas with CGI, you'd be able to render the scene from any angle you want and yeah. then the viewer would be able to see that. So, yeah, exactly. Uh, and I'm really kinda... excited to see how that matures, especially as the technology continues to get better because yeah. it's going to be so immersive to be actually be able to go right into the movie and, and be there. Yeah, I think it's cool. I think it's super exciting. <laughs> so uh, we talked a bit briefly about uh, 3D printing yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Um, did you guys have much opportunity to use 
any kind of 3D printing during the production? It's, ki it's kind of a thing that um, you see different departments kind of embracing uh, independently, like the production designer, when he was figuring out what like the hidden fortress, that kind of yeah. like the ape village behind the waterfall was gonna look like, he, he, had, he hired a couple model makers that okay. used 3D printing as part of their, their process. So they'd print little apes, they'd print little humans, they'd print little sections of like uh, pieces of that. that yeah. And that they sort of incorporated it into their overall model making kind of suite of tools. They'd also do, you know, they do a lot of traditional stuff the way they'd like, they'd sculpt foam, they'd spray paint it, and then they'd, you know, they'd put sticks in. And, um, and so it's a, it's a real kind of combination of different techniques that they use. But um, it was really useful for him and for the director to get their head around three-dimensionally what could the space look like, you know, because we were working, we had a little piece of um, location that we were, we were using, but we were adding on a big oh, piece oh, of, yeah. you know, a digital world. And when it's just inside the computer and you've got this, you know, the screen separating you from that space, especially for people that are, tend to be more hands-on, it can be a little tough to get your head around, okay, what is this place actually gonna look like? That's neat. Yeah. So you're getting to the point where, uh, like you mentioned, starting to use more VR, are you using that as another way to kind of like get into the into the scene and visualize it? More yeah, than yeah, we are. In fact, I think for us, um, having uh, done stuff in the uh, the kind of what we call the virtual production space, yeah. um, it's a natural kind of um, stepping stone into into the VR space. So like, what we would um, like what we did on let's say Tintin or, or some of these kind of heavier. Um, 3D environment spaces where we were using a lot of motion capture. We attached motion capture um, markers to a camera, and then we can track the camera. So, like, uh, if yeah. you're if you're the actor wearing the mocap suit, I've got a camera that also has mocap markers on it. I can film you, and I've got a record of your face. I can figure out my framing, but then I can also, using the tracking from you and from the camera, look at that in the virtual world and put the background behind and all that. So it essentially is it's it's a type of, of VR. Um, space, you know, where you've got uh, live movement being recorded at the same time and you can kind of see the, you yeah. know, the, you know, you work out scenes in that space interactively, which is pretty cool. Cool. All right, now getting back into more of some of the technical stuff, um, what do you think about the future of um, film formats, basically, like The Hobbit being shot in 240 uh, hertz and, and stuff like that? What, where do you see cinema moving towards? I think, I think it's really cool where um, now with the sort of different, um, n now that we've got you know, uh, technology that's more flexible in terms of projectors and mm -hmm. delivery formats, uh, filmmakers can make their own decisions about what the best format is for their, their film to be released. And you know, for a long time, um, they've made decisions about like, what the aspect ratio would be. Is it a widescreen yeah. with a, a narrow top and bottom? Is it, is it you know, do you have more of a, a field of view up and down, um, and depending on the particular kind of picture that they were making, they'd make decision. No, I want to. I want to go wide, or I want to see more of you know. Top. And um, and now they can you know they make decisions about frame rate. They can make decisions about um, you know how um, you know stereo whether they want to uh, yeah, yeah pursue that or and how how far they want to pursue that. Obviously, with with Avatar and with some of the um, James Cameron projects. Uh, shooting native stereo is a, a really important thing to him, and you get a certain kind of realism in the highlights and in the kind of immersive experience. Um, for other people, uh, they want to be able to push the, exaggerate kind of the, the properties of stereo and, and make it more like, um, a little more stylized, and so that's, you know, a different way to go with different projects. Yeah. So it's funny you mentioned the, uh, the technology of projectors, because uh, before I actually um, quit my job to pursue YouTube full time. I was working as a product developer for Christie Digital. Oh, cool! Which is oh, right. one of the big projector yeah. companies yeah, out there. Not the biggest. And uh, yeah, and they were pushing a lot of limits with the technology to actually be able to show stuff like The Hobbit yeah. at 240 hertz with uh, the 3D and whatnot. So I think uh, that's one of the things that's so cool about working with you know um, cutting edge directors is they really they push um, they push us in, us in visual effects and they push. Uh, the distributors and the, the hardware manufacturers mm -hmm. to really extend their tools to be able to tell the stories the way they want to tell them. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> so speaking from an animation perspective, um, Planet of the Apes was 24 frames per second? Y yep, that's yeah. right, yep. So um, how much does the cost go up when you do something like, say, 120 
frames per second, like because of the animation bandwidth yeah. and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Does, I, it, does it make a really big difference or like? Yeah, it does. <laughs> it, like um, for the Planet of the Apes, for example, uh, we had. Uh, it, I'm, I'm trying to do the math in my head now. It was in the millions of core hours that were required to, um, you know, to render the film. Yeah. Like, I think I, I figured out like if you, um, if you had like a a pretty high spec machine and you wanted to render the whole movie on that machine, you would have had to kick the render off when Ramses was Pharaoh of Egypt. Like it would render on a wow. on a single machine, even a a, a grunty machine. Yeah. So um, yeah, <laughs> so. You imagine now that's 24 frames per second. If you're doing 120 frames per second, you're looking at five times as long yeah. to you know to, to make the same movie. Yeah. So it's um, it's a big decision, and yeah. um, we do things sometimes where we'll figure out where y you really need the frames um, and do a section that's that's where every frame is rendered, and then other sections where it's just like dialogue, like you and I talking like this. Doesn't you can much. yeah you can do you can either double the frames or you can interpolate the frames and uh, yeah. you know it, it, it's, it ends up being just as good of a, a result so okay, there's yeah. a few things you can do to economize but every one of those little decisions every adjustment you make it's like okay we're gonna do this this way rather than that way that takes people time to figure out and mm -hmm. um, it's still added expense to your, yeah. your picture so yeah yeah, yeah I, I was involved early on on rise yeah. Um, before um, before Andy Serkis was cast as Caesar, before oh, wow. we even knew exactly how this performance te capture technology was was even going to work on a set. Yeah. So. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. I, cool. I came in as the the visual effects supervisor, and um, and I've been working with a team. There's been a few guys like uh, Eric Winquist is another one of our supervisors. He's been on from the very beginning. Of course, Joe Latiri has been on from from the beginning as well. So. Yeah. It's um, it's been a good run, and uh, Dan Barrett as well. Dan, um, when when Dan and I first started working on Rise, you know, we had some we had a lot of challenges with Caesar. We were just trying, still trying to figure out how um, to make his face communicate in the same way that Andy's did, and it took mm -hmm. us a while to um, to just kind of break it down and figure out what we needed to do. So there was a lot of kind of discovery and um, and like uh, exploration that, that happened along the way. And I think it pays off. Like in the movie, the last movie that we've done, we you know we we almost doubled our uh, number of characters. We added a whole bunch of new characters, and um, we were able to get them up and running and, and really expressive and interesting, you know, very quickly. Whereas if we tried to do that in the first film, it would have been um, mm -hmm. really tough. Yeah, I've, I've seen all the movies in theaters, and ever since the first one, I was, I was hooked. It was just like it's such a cool <laughs> concept, seeing it brought to life from that. Uh, yeah, it's, it's one of those. Series. It's one of those things where y we knew we were kind of taking a bit of a, a turn from, you know, the the old series where they, we had the makeup and the prosthetics, um, and we we thought it was the best decision for that the stories we were trying to tell. Yeah. But you never really know exactly how um, uh, how the fans are going to respond and how what the final result how you know how successful it will be. So uh, we feel really lucky to have been part of the process and really lucky to. Have um, you know had such good uh, filmmakers and good actors to collaborate with? Yeah. <laughs> so, what are some of the other projects you've worked on in the past? Other movies and whatnot? If you just list off, kind of. Oh like yeah, sure. Um, you've done. Just before uh, the Apes movies, I, I worked on Avatar. Okay. Cool. And uh, before that, we did. Um, and do you think you're gonna be working on the next Avatar? I don't or? know. We'll have no, to no, see. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot. Uh, a lot of moving. Can't say. <laughs> yeah. We'll uh, we'll have to see. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, um, before that, I, I actually came to New Zealand to work on Lord of the Rings. So oh, okay, yeah. that's uh, that's what got me here. And I wow. stayed around for King Kong, and uh, we did a few other movies along the way. So yeah, it's that's been awesome. a, been a good run. And do you know what you're working on next? I or? don't. Yeah. I don't know. I'm uh, I'm getting married in a yeah, few days. You're so saying, that's yeah, right. Congratu uh, congratulations. I'm gonna focus on that, and then uh, <laughs> and then we'll see if I get back. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Excellent. Great. I think that's all I have. All right. Well, excellent. Thank you, James. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> nice meeting you. Have you a too. safe uh, trip home. Thank you.